Chapter 5 Establishing the Establishment One of the primary reasons the insiders worked behind the scenes to foment World War I was to create in its aftermath a wor world government. If you wish to establish national monopolies, you must control national governments. If you wish to establish international monopolies or cartels, you must control a world government. After the armistice on November 11, 1918, Woodrow Wilson and his alter ego, Colonel House, the ever-present frontman for the insiders, went to Europe in hopes of establishing a world government in the form of the League of Nations. When the negotiations revealed one side had been as guilty as the other, and the glitter of the moral crusade evaporated along with Wilson's vaunted 14 points, the rubes back on Main Street began to waken. Reaction and disillusionment sent in. Americans certainly didn't want to get into world government with double-dealing Europeans, whose specialty was secret treaty hidden behind secret treaty. The guests of honor, so to speak, stalked out of the banquet before the poisoned meal could be served, and without American inclusion there could be no meaningful world government. Aroused public opinion made it obvious that the U.S. Senate dared not ratify a treaty, saddling the country with such an internationalist commitment. In some manner, the American public had to be sold on the idea of internationalism and world government. Again, the key was Colonel House. House had set down his political ideas in his book called Philip Drew, Administrator in 1912. In this book, House laid out a thinly fictionalized plan for conquest of America by establishing socialism as dreamed by Karl Marx. He described a conspiracy, the word in his which succeeds in electing a U.S. president by means of deception regarding his real opinions and intentions. Among other things, House wrote that the conspiracy was to insinuate itself into the primaries in order that no candidate might be nominated whose views were not in accord with theirs. Election were to become mere charades connected for the bedazzlement of the boo 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 The idea was to use both the Democrat and Republican parties as instruments to promote world government. In 1919, House met in Paris with members of a British secret society called the Round Table in order to form an organization whose job it was, would be to propagandize the citizens of America, England, and Western Europe on the glories of world government. The big selling point, of course, was peace. The part about the insiders establishing a world dictatorship quite naturally was left out. The Roundtable organization in England grew out of the lifelong dream of gold and diamond magnate Cecil Rhodes for a new world order. Rhodes' biographer, Sarah Millen, was a little more direct. As she put it, the government of the world was Rhodes' simple desire. Pickley notes, In the middle 1890s, Rhodes had a personal income of at least a million pounds sterling a year. Then about five mil then about five million dollars, which he spent so freely for his mysterious purposes that he was usually overdrawn in his, on his account. Cecile Rhodes' commitment to a conspiracy to establish world government was set down in a series of wills described by Frank Adelite in his book American Rhodes Scholarships. Adelite writes, The seven wills which Cecile Rhodes made between the ages of 24 and 46 Rhodes died at age 48, constitute a kind of spiritual autobiography. Best known are the first, the Secret Society Will, and the last, which established the Rhodes Scholarships. In his first will, Rhodes states his aim more, still more specifically, the extension of British rule throughout the world, the foundation of so great a power as to hereafter render wars impossible and promote the interests of humanity. The Confession of Faith enlarges upon these ideas. The model for this proposed secret society was the Society of Jesus, though he mentions also the Masons. It should be noted that the originator of this type of secret society was Adam Weishaupt, the monster who founded the Order of Illuminati on May 1, 1776, for the purpose of conspiracy to control the world. The role of Weishaupt's Illuminus in, in such horrors as the Reign of Terror is unquestioned in the techniques of the Illuminati, have been recognized as models for a communist methodology. Weishaupt also used the structure of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, as his model, and rewrote his code in Masonic terms. Adelaide continues, In 1888, Rhodes made his third will, leaving everything to Lord Rothschild, his financier in mining enterprises, 
with an accompanying letter enclosing the written matter discussed between us. This one surmises consisted of the first will and the confession of faith, since it sends in a postscript, Broad says, in considering questions suggested, take constitution of the Jesuits if obtainable. Apparently for strategic reasons, Lord Rothschild was subsequently removed from the forefront of the scheme. Professor Quigley reveals that Lord Rosebery replaced his father-in-law, Lord Rothschild, High Road Secret Group, and was made a trustee under Rhodes' next and last will. The secret society was organized on the conspiratorial pattern of circles within circles. Professor Quigley informs us that the central part of the secret society was established by March 1891 using Rhodes' money. The organization was run for Rothschild by Lord Alfred Miner Milner, discussed in the last chapter as a key financier of the Bolshevik Revolution. The round table worked behind the scenes at the highest levels of British government, influencing foreign policy and England's involvement in conduct of World War I. According to Professor Quigley, at the end of, of wo the war of 1914, it became clear that the organization of the system, the round table group, had to be greatly extended. Once again, the task was entrusted to Lionel Curtis, who established in England in each dominion a front organization to the existing round table group. This front organization, called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, had a, as its nucleus in each area the existing submerged roundtable group. In New York, it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations and was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company in association with the very small American roundtable group. The American organizers were dominated by the large number of Morgan experts who had gone to the Paris Peace Conference and there became close friends with a similar group of English experts which had been recruited by the Milner Group. In fact, the original plans for the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council of Foreign Relations were drawn up in Paris. Joseph Kraft, CFR, ho however, tells us in Harper's of July 1958 that the chief agent in the formal founding of the Council on Foreign Relations was Colonel House, supported by such protégés as Walter Lippmann, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles and Christian Hart Herder. It was House who acted as host for the roundtable group, both English and American. At the key meeting of May 19, 1919, in the Majestic Hotel, Paris, which committed the conspiracy to creation of the CFR, although Quigley stresses the importance of Morgan men and the creation of the organization known as the Council on Foreign Relations, this organization's own materials and Colonel House's own memoirs reveal his function as midwife at the birth of the CFR. The CFR's 25th annual report tells us this of the CFR's founding at Paris. The Institute of International Affairs, founded at Paris in 1918, 1919, was comprised at the outset of two branches, one in the United Nations Kingdom and one in the United States. Later, the plan was changed to create an, an ostensible uh, autonomy because it seemed unwise to set up a single institute with branches. It had to be made to appear that the CFR in America and the RIIA in Britain were really international bo independent bodies, lest the American public become aware the CFR was in fact a subsidiary of the Roundtable Group and react in patriotic fury. According to Quigley, the most important financial destinies in America following World War I were, in addition to Morgan, the Rockefeller family, Kuhn Loeb and Company, Dylan Reed and Company, and Brown Brothers Harriman, all were represented in the CFR, and Paul Warburg was one of the incorporators. The insider crowd, which created the Federal Reserve System, many of whom also bankrolled the Bolshevik Revolution, were all in the original membership. In addition to Paul Warburg, founders of the CFR included international financial insiders Jacob Schiff, Avril Harriman, Frank Vanderlip, Nelson Aldrich, Bernard Baruch, J.P. Morgan, and John D. Rockefeller. These men did not create the CFR because they had nothing better to do with their time and money. They created it as a tool to further their ambitions. The CFR has come to be known as the Establishment, the Invisible Government, and the Rockefeller Foreign Office. This semi-secret organization unquestionably has become the most influential group in America. One of the extremely infrequent articles to appear in the national press concerning this council was published in the Christian Science Monitor of September 1st, 1961. It began this way.
On the west side of Fashional Park Avenue at 68th Street in New York City sit two handsome buildings across the way from each other. One is the Soviet Embassy to the United Nations. Directly opposed on the southwest corner is the Council on Foreign Relations, probably one of the most influential semi-public organizations in the field of foreign policy. Although the formal membership in the CFR is composed of close to 1,500 of the most elite names in the worlds of government, labor, business, finance, communications, the foundations, and the acad academy, and despite the fact that it has staffed almost every key position of every administration since those of FDR, it is doubtful that one American in a thousand so much as recognizes the council's name, or that one in ten thousand can relate anything at all about its structure or purpose, indicative of the CFR's power to maintain its anonymity is the fact that despite it, its having been operated at the highest levels for nearly 50 years and having from the beginning counted among its members the foremost lions of the establishment communications media, we discovered after poring over volumes of the re Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature covering several decades that only one magazine article on the CFR has ever appeared in a major national journal and that in Harper's hardly a mass circulation periodical. Similarly, only a handful of articles on the Council had appeared in the nation's great newspapers. Such anonymity at, the, at that level can hardly be a matter of mere chance. What makes this secret organization so influential? No one who, who knows for a certainty will say. The Christian Science Monitor, which is edited by a member of the American Roundtable, a branch of Milner's Secret Society, did not in the article of September 1st, 1961, that its roster contains names distinguished in the field of diplo diplomacy, government, business, finance, science, labor, journalism, law, and education. What united so wide-ranging and, des and disparate a membership is a passionate concern for the direction of American foreign policy. The Christian Science Monitor indicates the fantastic power the CFR has had during the last six administrations. Because of the Council's single-minded dedication to studying and deliber deliberating American foreign policy, there is a constant flow of its members from private to public service. Almost half of the Council members have been invited to assume official government positions or to act as consultants at one time or another. The policies promoted by the CFR in the fields of defense and international relations become with a regularity which defies the laws of chance. The official policies of the United States government, as liberal columnist Joseph Kraft, himself a member of the CFR, noted of the Council in the Harper's article, has been the seat of some basic government decisions, has set this context for many more, and has repeatedly served as a recruiting ground for ranking officials. Kraft incidentally aptly titled his article on the CFR, School for Statesmen, an admission that the members of the council were drilled with a line of strategy to be carried out in Washington. As World War II approached, the roundtable group was influential in saying that Hitler was not stopped in Austria, the Rhineland or Su Su Sudetenland, and thereby was largely responsible for precipitating the Holocaust. A second world war would greatly enhance the opportunity for establishment of world government. The financing for Adolf Hitler's rise to power was handled through the Warburg-controlled Mendelssohn Bank of Amsterdam and later by the, Henry J., the J. Henry Schroeder Bank with branches in Frankfurt, London, New York. Chief legal counsel to the J. Henry Schroeder Bank was the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell, whose senior partners included John Foster and Alan Dules. With the roundtable doing its work in Europe, the CFR carried the ball in the United States. The Council's first task was to infiltrate and develop effective control of the U.S. State Department to make certain that after World War II there would be no slip-ups slip as there had been following World War I. The story of the CFR takeover of the Department of State is contained in State Department Publication 2349, Report to the President on the Results of, of the San Francisco Conference. It is the report of Secretary of State Edward R. Stettinius, CFR, to President Truman. On page 20 we find, With the outbreak of war in Europe, it was clear that the United States would be confronted after the war with new and exceptional problems. Accordingly, a committee on post-war problems was set up before the end of 1939. 
two years before the U.S. entered the war, at the suggestion of the CFR. The committee consisted of high officials of the Department of State, all but one of whom were CFR members, was assisted by a research staff, provided by, financed by, and directed by the CFR, which in February 1941 was organized into a division of special research, went off the CFR payroll and, and on to that of the State Department. After Pearl Harbor, the research facilities were rapidly expanded, and the Departmental Committee on Post-War Problems was reorganized into an advisory committee on post-war foreign, foreign policies, completely staffed by the CFR. This is the group which de designed the United Nations, the first major successful step on the road to a world superstate. At least 47 CFR members were among the American delegates to the founding of the United Nations in San Francisco in 1945. Members of the CFR group included Harold Stassen, John J. McCloy, Owen Lattimore, called by the Senate International Security Subcommittee a conscious articulate instrument of the Soviet conspiracy, Alger Hiss, communist spy, Philip Jessup, Harry Dexter, white, communist agent, Nelson Rockefeller, John Foster Doulis, John Carter Vincent, security risk, and Dean Atchison, just to make sure that Communist Party members understood the importance of the UN establishment, political affairs, the party's official theoretical journal in the, in the April 1945 issue gave the order. Great popular support and enthusiasm for the United Nations policy should be built up well, organized, and fully articulate. But it is also necessary to do more than that. The opposition must be rendered so Im impotent that it will be unable to gather any significant support in the Senate against the United Nations Charter and the treaties which will follow. One wonders if the boobs at the party level ever question why they were to support an organization dominated by the hated Wall Street personalities. The landscape painters of the mass media have outdone themselves, painting the UN as a peace organization instead of a front for the international bankers. Not only did members of the Council on Foreign Relations dominate the establishment of the UN, but CFR members were at the elbow of the American president at Teheran, Potsdam, and Yalta, where hundreds of millions of human beings were delivered into the hands of Joseph Stalin, vastly extending the power of the international communist conspiracy. Administrative assistant to FDR during this time was a key member of the CFR named Lachlan Curry, subsequently identified by J. Edgar Hoover as a Soviet agent. So completely has the CFR dominated the State Department over the past 38 years that every Secretary of State except Cordial Hall, James Burness, and William Rogers has been a member of the CFR. While Rogers is not a member, Professor Henry Kissinger and Mr. Nicholson's chief foreign policy advisor came to the job from the staff of the CFR and the under secretaries of state, almost to a man, are CFR members. Today the CFR remains active in working toward its final goal of a government over all the world, a government which the insiders and their allies will control. The goal of the CFR is simply to abolish the United States with its constitutional guarantees of liberty. They don't even try to hide it. Study number 7, published by the CFR November 25, 1959, openly advocates building a new international order which must be responsive to world aspirations for peace and for social and economic change. An international order, code word for world government, including states labeling themselves as socialists, communists. The reason it's evident to those who have studied its membership for this little-known semi-secret organization to be called the Establishment, see Chart 7, international banking organizations that currently have men in the CFR included Kuhn Loeb and Company, Lazard Ferez, directly affiliated with Rothschild, Dylan Reed, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, Chase, Manhattan Bank, Morgan Guarantee Bank, Brown Brothers, Harriman, First National City Bank, Chemical Bank and Trust, and Manufacturers Hanover Trust Bank. Among the major corporations that have men in the CFR are Standard Oil, IBM, Xerox, Eastman Kodak, Pan American, Firestone, U.S. Steel, General Electric, and American Telephone and Telegraph Company. Also in the CFR are men from such openly leftist organizations as the Fabian Socialist Americans for Demo Democratic Action, the Valley Socialist League for Industrial Democracy, formerly the Inter 
Nicola Gates so Secret Socialist Society and United World Federalists, which openly advocates world government with the communists. Such devotedly socialist labor leaders as the late Walter Raffau, David Dubinsky, and Jay Lovestone have also been members of the CFR. In theory, these men and organizations are supposed to be the blood enemies of the banks and businesses listed above, yet they all belong to the same lodge. You can see why the fact is not advertised. The CFR is totally interlocked with the major foundations and so-called think tanks, including the interlock of the Rockefeller, Ford, and Carnegie Foundations, and the Rand Corporation, Hudson Institute, Fund for the Republic, and Brookings Institute think tanks. The fact that the CFR operates in near complete anonymity can hardly be accidental. Among the communications corporations represented in the CFR are National Broadcasting Corporation (NBC). Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS, Time, Life, Fortune, Look, Newsweek, New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, New York Post, Denver Post, Louisville Courier Journal, Minneapolis Tribune, The Night Papers, McGraw-Hill, Simon & Schuster, Harper Brothers, Random House, Little Brown & Co., McMillan Co., Viking Press, Saturday Review, Business Week, and Book of the Month Club. Surely the CFR could get a few blurbs of publicity if publicity were desired. If it seems impossible that one entity could control such a vast array of firms, it is because most people do not know that the so-called founders of such giants as the New York Times and NBC were chosen, financed, and directed by Morgan Schiff and their allies. The case of Adolph Oaks of the Times and David Sarnoff of the RCA are examples of this control. Both were given early financial aid by Kuhn, Loeb & Company, and Morgan Guarantee. These are the establishment's official landscape painters whose job is to make sure the public does not discover the CFR and its role in creating a world socialist dictatorship. You will recall that Kremlin House believed we should have two political parties, but only a single ideology, one world socialism. This is exactly what we have in this country today. See Chart 8. Although there are philosophical differences between the grassroots Democrats and the grassroots Republicans, yet as you move up the party ladders, these differences become less and less distinguishable, until finally the ladder disappears behind the establishment's managed new curtains and come together at the apex under the control of the CFR. In 1968, when George Wallace maintained that he, there wasn't a dime's worth of difference between the two parties, he may not have known how right he was or why. The following are so-called Democrats who have been or now are CFR agents. Dean Axon, Alger Hiss, Adlai Stevenson, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Edward Kennedy, Avril Harriman, George Ball, Henry Fowler, Dean Rusk, Adam Yarmolinsky, Hubert Humphrey, and John Lindsay. It is interesting to note that rewards of cushy jobs were given by the international bankers to many men high in the LBJ administration for their services. Under Secretary of State George Ball went with Lehman Brothers, Secretary of the Treasury Henry Fowler was taken in by Goldman Sachs & Co., Budget Director Peter Lewis, Under Secretary of the Treasury Frederick Deming, and former Secretary of Commerce C.R. Smith all avoided the breadlines by being picked up by Lazard Ferris Rothschilds. Fowler and Deming were largely responsible for policies which led to European nations claiming half of our gold and having potential claims on the rest, as well as den denuding the U.S. Treasury of all of the silver reserves that had built up over a century of time. Did the international bankers take pity on these men for their incompetence, or were they rewarded for a job well done? Controlling the Republican Party for the CFR has been Dwight D. Eisenhower, John Foster Dulles, Thomas E. Dewey, Jacob Javits, Robert McNamara, Henry Cabot Lodge, Paul Hoffman, John Gardner, the Rockefeller clan, Elliot Richardson, Arthur Burns, Henry Kissinger, and Richard Nixon. Footnote. Richard Nixon now claims that he no longer belongs to the CFR, having dropped out with the, when the organization became an issue in its primary campaign for the governorship of California in 1962. Nixon has never said why he dropped out, but the fact that he was appointed over has appointed over 110 CFR members to important positions in his administration speaks for itself. It should come as no surprise that the very same Richard Nixon who campaigned in 1968 as a conservative had already made his real position very clear to the insiders of the CFR. 
but authoring an article in the CFR magazine, Foreign Affairs, in October 1967. The title of this article, Asia After Vietnam, revealed how the aspiring President Nixon would open a new policy toward Red China and bring realism to our Asian foreign policy. The CFR's annual report for 1952 admitted that sometimes members in sensitive positions were forced to go underground and keep the membership secret. While it is true that every administration since FDR has been dominated by the CFR, the Nixon administration has set the all-time record by appointing over 110 CFR members to key positions. Henry Kissinger, the Colonel House of the Nixon administration, kept to his, came to his job directly from employment on the CFR staff. Kissinger represents the very opposite of everything Nixon said he stood for in his campaign. Both liberals and conservatives admit Kissinger is by far the most important man in the Nixon administration. Administrations, both Democrat and Republican, come and go, but the CFR lingers on. This is why the more things seem to change, the more they remain the same. The fix is in the top, where the same code tier of insiders bent on control of the world runs the show. As Professor Quigley admits, who does exist and has existed for a generation, an international network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes the communists act. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the roundtable groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the communists or any other groups and frequently does so. Yes, the insiders have no aversion to working with the communists whose ostensible goal is to destroy them. While the insiders are serving champagne and caviar to their guests in their summer mansions at Newport or entertaining other members of the social elite aboard their yachts, their agents are out enslaving and murdering people, and you are next on their list. Clearly, the Chicago Tribune's editorial of December 9, 1950 on the CFR still applies. The members of the Council on Foreign Relations are persons of much more than average influence in their community. They have used the prestige that their wealth, their social position, and their education have given them to lead their country toward bankruptcy and military debacle. They should look at their hands. There is blood on them, the dried blood of the last war and the fresh blood of the present one, the Korean War. It goes without saying that the CFR's hands are bloodier now with the gore of 50,000 Americans in Vietnam. Shamefully, the Council has su succeeded in promoting as American policy the shipment of American aid and trade to the East European arsenal of the Viet Cong for the killing of our sons in the field. It should not be surprising to learn that there is an international level and organizational equivalent of the CFR. This group calls itself the Bilderbergers. If scarcely one American in a thousand has any familiarity with the CFR, it is doubtful that one in five thousand has any knowledge of the Bilderbergers. Again, this is not accidental. The strange name of this group is taken from the site of the first meeting in May 1954, the Hotel de Bilderberg in Oostbeek, Holland. The man who created the Bilderbergers is His Royal Highness Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. The prince is an important figure in Royal Dutch Petroleum, Shell Oil, and the Societe General de Belgique of some conglomerate cartel with worldwide holdings. The Bilderbergers meet once or sometimes twice a year. Those in attendance include leading political and financial figures from the United States and Western Europe. Prince Bernhard makes no effort to hide the fact that the ultimate goal of the Bilderbergers is the world government. In the meantime, while the New World Order is being built, the Bilderbergers coordinate the efforts of the European and American power elites. Prince Bernhard's counterpart among the American Bilderbergers is David Rockefeller, chairman of the board of the CFR, whose economic base is the giant Chase Manhattan Bank and Standard Oil. Among the other Bilderbergers from the world of ultra-high finance are Baron Edmund de Rothschild of the House of Rothschild, C. Douglas Dillon, CFR, of Dillon, Reed & Co., Robert McNamara, of the World Bank, Sir Eric Roll, of S.G. Warburg & Co., Limited, Pierce Paul Schweitzer, of the International Monetary Fund, and George Ball, CFR, of Lehman Brothers. Not everyone who attends one of the Bilderberger's secret meetings is an insider, but only men of the left are allowed to attend the private meetings following the general sessions. 
The avowedly socialist parties of Europe are well represented. Another example of the tie-in between the insiders of high finance and the ostensible leaders of the proletariat. Bilderberg policy is not planned by those who attend the conference, but by the elite steering committee of insiders composed of 24 Europeans and 15 Americans. Past and present Americans of the Bilderberger steering committee include George W. Ball, Gardner Cowles, John H. Ferguson, Henry J. Hines II, Robert D. Murphy, David Rockefeller, Shepard Stone, James D. Zellerbach, Emilio G. Colado, Arthur H. Dean, Gabriel Hogg, C.D. Jackson, George Nebolzin, Dean Rusk, and General Walter Bedell Smith. Those who adhere to the accidental theory of history will call that it is a sheer coincidence that every single one of these named as past and present members of the Bilderberg Stirring Committee is or was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. The Bilderberger Advisory Committee forms an even more inner circle than the Stirring Committee. Americans on the Advisory Committee include Joseph E. Johnson, Dean Rask, Arthur H. Dean, George Nibelzin, John S. Coleman, General Walter Bedell Smith and Henry J. Hines II. Again, all are members of the CFR. One would assume, that is, if one had not read this book, that when the world's leading parliamentarians and inter international tycoons meet to discuss the planning of their various nations' foreign policies, that the news hawks from papers and television land would be screaming to high heaven that such an event held in secret makes a mockery of the dem democratic process. One might expect Walter Cronkite to be thundering in wrath about an elite clique meeting to plan our lives, or the New York Times editorialist to be pounding their smoking typewriters, fuming about the public's right to know. But of course, the landscape painters merely brushed the Bilderbergers right out of existence and focused the public's attention on something like the conditions in the prisons or coke bottles littering the highways. Since the Bilderbergers are a group of the left, or, as liberals in the media might say, but don't, a pro group of progressives, they are allowed to go on in peace and quiet planning for 1984. The fact that there is heavy Rockefeller, Chase Manhattan Bank, and CFR influence in the media might also have something to do with the fact that while everybody has heard of, say, the John Birch Society, and almost always in a derogatory manner from the Eastern establishment media, practically... Nobody has heard of the Bilderbergers. As this is written, there have been 29 Bilderberg meetings to date. They usually last three days and held in remote plush quarters. The participants are housed in one location and are protected by a thorough security network. Decisions are reached, resolutions adopted, plans of action initiated, but only Bilderbergers ever know for sure what occurred. We must assume that these people did not congregate merely to discuss their golf scores. The press, naturally, is not allowed to be present, although occasionally a brief press conference is held at the end of the meeting, at which time the news media are given, in very general terms, the Bilderberger version of what was discussed. Why all the secrecy if there is really nothing to hide? Why do the Ford, Rockefeller, and Carnegie Foundations finance the meetings if they are not important? Yes, why? The most recent meeting took place at Lawrence Rockefeller's Words Woodstock Inn at Woodstock, Vermont, April 23rd, 24th, 25th, 1971. Apparently, the only newspaper to carry a substantial story of the meeting was the Rutland, Vermont Herald, whose report could acquire only sketchy information about what the meeting was all about. The April 20th, 1971 issue of the Herald reported, A rather tight lid of secrecy was being kept on the conference, a closed dual meeting was held in Woodstock last week to brief a handful of local officials on some phases of the conference. One participant of the meeting insisted Monday that the officials were told the meeting would be an international peace conference. However, other reliable sources said the conference will deal with international finance. The Woodstock Inn will apparently be sealed up by Fort Knox. No press coverage will be allowed, in the exception of issuing a statement at the close of the meeting on Sunday. When Prince Bernhard arrived at Boston's Logan Airport, he did admit to reporters that the subject of the conference would be the change in the world role of the United States. Isn't it nice to have changes in America's role in the world decided upon by Bernhard, Rothschild, and Rockefeller? There is real democracy in action, as they say. President at the scene to carry back orders to Mr. Nixon was CFR Rockefeller Aaron Boy, the president's number one advisor on foreign affairs, Henry Kissinger. 
shortly after the Woodstock meeting, two ominous and role-changing events occurred. Henry Kissinger went to Peking and arranged for the acceptance of Red China as a member of the family of trading nations, and an international monetary crisis developed after which the dollar was devalued. As the British statesman and Rothschild confidant Benjamin Disraeli wrote in Coningsby, So you see, my dear Coningsby, that the world is governed by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes.